So let's talk about theater. That's kind of a powerful thing, maybe used to be. I read these articles about plays that opened in the 30s, and they would open to sell out crowds in the thousands, with that many thousand more thronging outside, and I just think, is this still relevant? What is the point of theater today? in the era of super stadiums and streaming and blockbuster premieres. What is the point of this? The goal of a theatrical experience, like, say, TED, is to make an audience uncomfortable. And this is a medium that can still do that, right? Because it's live and it's personal. There's a certain contract and a relationship between the performer and the audience, and that is that what this is will happen, and it will happen once. Yesterday's audience did not see this, and tomorrow's never will. So we have this relationship with the audience, and the goal is to make them a little bit uncomfortable, to push them just a bit, to elevate the patron into a space of witness, the spectator into a spect actor, to take a group of people seated comfortably on a status quo, the same status quo that gave them the means to go to the theater, and to make them a little bit uncomfortable. And so we have this relationship, and the power of theater is in this space. It's the relationship between here and there, and the energy that lies in between. And I saw this once, I think. I worked in a production last year called Visible Impact. It was a devised show, which meant that we wrote and compiled the script, as opposed to performing a pre-written, published text. It was conceived and directed by Professor Susan Linsky here at Georgetown, and it dealt with issues of deafness and disability. But there was a twist. Professor Linsky decided to actually cast actors who were deaf and who had physical disabilities. It's a crazy idea, right? Think of the number of actors, of mainstream actors that you have seen who are deaf or disabled. Like maybe one. Now think of the number of actors, that you, of able actors, that you have seen win Academy Awards for playing these kinds of characters. So here we are, we had to perform this play but first we had to write and make this play, but we had this huge barrier, and that was language. About half the cast was speaking English, and about half the cast was signing ASL. So some days we had interpreters, and some days we didn't. And we had to figure it out because we had to make something that was new and troubling and creative and uncomfortable, and we had about a month and a half to do it. And what we found was kind of interesting, and that was that we could actually still communicate. We could communicate pretty well because we had these commonalities that we already knew. We all cared about the work. We all cared about the issues. We all cared about Shakespeare. And so we found ways to communicate, and sometimes that was passing a cell phone around and typing. Other times it was gesturing meaningfully, even if it wasn't actual coded ASL. And sometimes it was just the expressions on our faces, or as Professor Linsky likes to say, our heart lights. And so we communicated whatever that meant that day, and from those conversations, a play was born one that was visual and oral and totally accessible, one that nudged the audience a bit because we had been nudged first. And for the first time in my life, after that play, an audience member came up to me and just said, thank you. Talk about a powerful thing. That was a powerful thing. And I think it's because it was theater, I think, that mattered. We were talking about or signing about things that mattered. So right now I'm, I'm working on a new project. I'm writing and directing a play that's an adaptation of a oral history piece about the gentrification of a queer neighborhood in San Francisco. And it's challenging because it's hustlers and druggies and strippers and sex workers and queens, and we're all Georgetown students performing for a Georgetown audience in a recently gentrified city, and what the hell do we know? But I think back to visible impact in that model. I think about the communication that took place in our rehearsal space, hard as that was. It was electric and it was accessible and it connected us across different cultures, across different languages and diverse abilities. I like to think of a new kind of theater, one that pushes its audience just a bit. I like to think of, an audi of a new kind of theater that is empowering, that, get, that is born from communication and passes that communication to its audience. I like to think of a theater that can get people to talk because that really is an incredible thing, to get somebody to talk to talk and then if they take that talk into the the lobby, and they talk there, and they take that talk back to their cars, and then to their homes, and their bedrooms, and their dreams, and their lives, and all of a sudden, you have this magical place of unlimited potentialities, not because of what has happened, but because of the imaginations in the people who have witnessed it. I like to think of 
a theater that passes this activation onto its audience. Because the true measure of an artistic experience is not in the creativity of the artist or the art, it's in the creativity of the ones who leave it. Are they awake? Are they alive? Are they excited? Are they frightened? Are they troubled? Because ideas worth spreading are not conceived in comfortable minds. After we opened, we had a reception in the lobby for Visible Impact. And my professor came up to me and she took my arm and she whispered, look at the conversation that we've started. It is all around us and it's silent. I like to think of a theater that can do this, one that is powerful in that it is relevant, in that it is troubling. I like to think of a theater that elevates patron to spectator, to witness, that takes an audience and makes them into actors on a whole new stage. And sometimes, when you do that, somebody will come up to you and say something that is crazy and uncomfortable and wildly powerful, like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>